All right, let's begin. We're in uh, First and Second Peter, a message for today's church from Peter the Apostle. Uh, this is lesson number six in the series. It's entitled Peter's Last Sermon. And um, we are in Second Peter. We've completed first. We're in Second Peter uh, chapter one. So uh, in the first epistle of Peter, just to review here, uh, Peter talks about the effects of grace on a person, how you can recognize the grace of God working in a person's life. He, you know, he enumerates the various changes, various effects that grace has on a, on a person's life, and that was the substance of our study in, uh, in 1 Peter. Uh, in the second letter, Peter deals with different things uh, because his own situation is different. So his situation changes and it changes what he is going to write to the church uh, about. So I, I, I want you to imagine for a moment if you were the one that God had chosen to do the following things. Imagine if you were the person selected to preach the very first gospel sermon, you know, the full gospel sermon, death, burial, resurrection of Christ. What if you were the one that was chosen to preach that? What if you were the one uh, who was selected to organize and, and be an elder and a leader in the first congregation of the Lord's church? Well, what if that was you? What if you were given the opportunity to actually bring the gospel to the Gentiles, a whole new group of people uh, other than the Jews? What if it was you that was given the task of producing inspired writings? And what if it was you, along with the other apostles, that uh, uh, was tasked with providing leadership for all the churches throughout the, throughout the empire during your lifetime? Now imagine that you're that person, you've got all those responsibilities. And then all of a sudden, like Peter did, and then all of a sudden you knew that you were going to die very soon. What would you do? Now historians tell us that Peter was in Rome in 67 AD and he was caught up in the persecution of uh, Christians that was going on at the time. Some say he was finally executed uh, by being crucified upside down because he refused to die in the same manner that his Lord died and so they uh, apparently uh, acceded to his wish. They crucified him upside down. Well, whatever, whatever manner of his death, Peter knew that the end was near and he wrote one last letter to the churches before his death. He had one last chance to speak to the brethren, one last sermon to give, one last opportunity to teach them. And this letter that we're going to study, 2 Peter, contains what the Holy Spirit directed him to write in his final communication. So the first thing he wanted to tell these people that he's writing to and this, the idea that we're going to study today is this. He told them, you have to grow or you're going to die. As Christians, you must grow or you'll die, die spiritually. So Peter reminds them that Christianity is a process. It's a, it's a journey. It's a transformation that must take place. And in chapter one of his second letter, he describes the changes that need to take place not only to complete the journey, but also to confirm that we are actually on the right road, you know, that we're on the right journey. All right, so if you, if you keep those ideas in mind, if you keep that in context, that this is Peter's last letter to the churches before he dies, and the first message he sends to them is, you, you need to grow spiritually or you'll die. So let's go to verse one, 1 Peter chapter one, verse one, and let's read. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he starts by introducing himself and the relationship that he and his readers have. He's an apostle. He's a special messenger of Jesus Christ. Now in those days there were a lot of messengers, you know, a lot of evangelists traveling around. They were messengers. Missionaries, they were messengers. But only those who had been chosen by Jesus Himself and only those who had witnessed 
both his baptism and his death and resurrection, only those people could be referred to as apostles. We know the one exception is Paul, of course, called later by the Lord. So apostles had a special calling, Jesus himself called them. They had a special experience. They, they were with Jesus throughout his experience, throughout his ministry. They had a special task, and their task was to witness his resurrection, and they did miracles many times to prove that their witness was, was true. And they also had a special authority. Their letters were inspired. They wrote as inspired, um, uh, inspired individuals uh, from, the, uh, from the Spirit of God. I want you to note also that he uses the term bondservant, which denotes his humility. Yes, it's true, he's a, he's a special apostle, he has special gifts, he has special authority, but all of that means that he is simply a slave to Jesus Christ, not someone who lords his position over other people. You know, he, had, he had reason maybe to be proud. He did miracles, he saw the Lord, he was one of the special, you know, he had all kinds of reasons to be kind of full of himself, but he isn't. He says, despite all of these things that I have, all I really am is a bondservant of Jesus Christ, the lowest kind of servant in those days. So he describes the readers as people who are basically the same as himself, same as the other apostles, people who have been saved because of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And you know, he's telling his readers, you and I are the same. I may have a special task, I may have been given special abilities, but basically we're the same. We're people who've been saved through the grace of God and faith in Jesus Christ. As I said, he may have had a special role and responsibility in the church, but in essence, he's connected to his readers in the same way that all Christians are connected. All were sinners at one time, and all have been saved through faith in Christ made possible by God's kindness and righteousness. That's what connects all of us here, and that's what connects all of us here to all the other Christians in the world. We're all the same in the sense that once we were sinners, and now we're saved. You know, that's the thing that connects us. All right, let's keep reading here. Uh, in the next couple of verses, Peter's going to offer a blessing. And then he explains how we come into this blessing that he offers. So verse two, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So grace, you need to understand, it's a special word here, grace is the word that encompasses all the good things that God gives us. You know, He saves us from sin, He makes us righteous, we become sons of God, we're, you know, we receive the Holy Spirit, we have the promise of heaven, you know, all of those blessings. You know, well, Peter takes all of those blessings and he compresses them all down into a single word, grace. So that, there's a kind of a key word there, okay? So grace is the word that encompasses all the good things that God has given us, all the favors. Peace is the feeling and the condition that one who receives God's grace finds himself in. So Peter says that this combination of blessings and enjoyment that comes uh, from them will increase in proportion to the degree that a person comes to know God and Jesus Christ his Son. All right, you get the idea? All of these blessings, grace, Peace, that experience that you have, peace with God, peace with yourself, you know, that grace and peace, that increases in relationship to how much you know God. The more you know God, the more your grace and peace. The more, you, the more deeply that you come to understand God, the deeper your relationship is with God, the greater your, the greater your grace, the greater your peace. Now here he says the knowledge of God, the word know here is not just a casual knowledge or an acquaintance. You know, somebody say, hey, you know Jimmy from work? Yeah, yeah, we work in the same building. Yeah, I know him. Not that kind of know. The knowledge here, this word here, denotes an exact or full knowledge. The degree of knowledge where the knower can influence the one who is known. That kind of knowledge. So in verse three he says, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory 
and excellence. So humans can know God only to the degree that He reveals Himself. Now remember, He's, just, he's, he's explaining this grace and peace idea Grace and peace in proportion to how much you know God. He's developing this idea and the first thing he says is human beings can know God only to the degree that God reveals Himself. So you can know that God, for example, is creative and He's powerful and He's wise from what He has made. How powerful is God to make all those stars? You know what I'm saying? That kind of knowledge. But the creation doesn't reveal what God thinks or what He wants from man or what the future is going to be, or what the spiritual world is like. I can look at the Rocky Mountains all day long and I can't figure out what, what God thinks. I, I can see that He must be powerful to have created the Rocky Mountains or you know, whatever, the, the wonders in the world, the sun. But looking up at the sun doesn't tell me what God wants me to do. I can stare at the sun all day long and I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to know that. The knowledge of these things is only available if God actually reveals it to man. The only way I can know what God is thinking is if God tells me. So man can only know God and consequently experience you know, that blessing, that peace and grace from knowing Him. Man can only have that to the degree that God allows Himself to be known. So God is the one who reveals to us about Jesus Christ. God is the one who reveals to us what the afterlife is like. He reveals this to us. So concerning this, Peter says that God has opened Himself up to full disclosure because He has, per, uh, he has permitted true knowledge. So let's backtrack here. Grace and peace based on how much we know God. The good news, Peter says, is that God has opened Himself up to full knowledge. Oh, that's a good thing. Full knowledge. And this true knowledge was made available through the gospel, which he refers to as the calling, and the appearance of Jesus Christ, who he refers to as His own glory and excellence. So uh, grace and peace based on how much you know God. Good news, uh, boys and girls, God has permitted full knowledge. Wow, that means unlimited grace and peace. And that full knowledge has been available through Jesus Christ. That full knowledge has been offered through the gospel. So in essence what Peter is saying, bring it down a little bit here, life and godliness that comes with true knowledge of God is now available because God has fully revealed Himself through Jesus Christ. So if grace and peace increase as I know God, then there's good news because God is open to be known fully. And so whatever amount of grace and peace is available, I have access to it because I'm a Christian. So in verse four, he summarizes and explains the true nature of the blessings and peace that he first mentioned in verse two. So let's read verse four. He says, for by these, everything he's said so far, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them, the promises, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. So, he says, through the revelation of Himself, we have true knowledge, you know, full access, full knowledge. Then he says, true knowledge gives us access to godliness and spiritual life. And these blessings enable us to escape the condemnation that will fall on those who remain ignorant of God and corrupted by sin and attached to this world. You know, we're not here to save the earth. I've, I've said that to you before. What's our calling? We're not here to save the world. We're not here to save the earth, save the seal, save the, save the ocean. That's not our calling. So in other words, knowing God and knowing Christ is a great blessing because this knowledge permits us to escape the destruction that will come to this world and all those who are part of it. In other words, how do I get out of this place because you know, condemnation is coming to it, it's going to be destroyed and I'm part of it, I'm a human being, right? How do I get out of it? And Peter says you get out of it by knowing God. And the good news for you is that God is open to be known completely. 
All right, now in the next seven verses, Peter explains how this knowledge of God and Christ is developed. It's a cooperative effort, he says, involving God and Christ and the individual. So here's how it works. First of all, God creates the universe, man, and sets all in motion. After man sins, he loses his knowledge and relationship with God. That's the, that's the thing that sin damaged. We had this relationship with God, this open and full relationship with Him, Adam and Eve did, and that's what guaranteed their constant and continual existence. And when they sinned, they began to lose that knowledge of Him. And they, they and subsequent generations just kept falling deeper and darker into the darkness. That's the problem with sin. And so because of that, man is doomed to suffer death along with the creation. Why? Because of his ignorance, that's why. And sin. Number two, Christ comes on earth to atone for man's sins and to enable mankind to once again know God and have a relationship with Him again, and thus save Himself from the decay and death that the world is and will suffer. Three, man responds to God and Christ's efforts and offer by receiving again the knowledge of God and reestablishing his relationship with God once again. Now, in verses five to 11, Peter explains man's part, that was God's part, sending Jesus, so on and so That was God's part. So in verse five to 11, Peter explains man's part in knowing God and how this affects his life and his salvation. And he explains the growth process that leads to a greater and greater knowledge of God. Remember the idea is grace and peace increase as you know God. God is open to be known fully. Okay, so how do I do that? How do I increase my knowledge of God? Okay, so Peter explains how you do that. Let's read verses five to seven. He says, now for this very reason also, when he says for this very reason, that summarizes everything else. For this very reason, because God's open to full knowledge, full knowledge gives you grace and peace. Because of that, he says, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. That's the process of knowing God. So it begins with diligence, effort, commitment, resolve to the process itself, right? You, you go to the gym, you, you want to lose some weight, you want to tone up, you know, get ready, whatever, for sports or something like that. What, what, what does your coach tell you? You need to be committed to the process. You need to be coming in three times a week on a regular basis, you just need to be committed to it. You, know, you need to buy into the process and then just you know, stick with it. And that's the same, right, with anything else. You want to lose some weight, you want to do this, you want to do that. You got you to gotta stick with the process. So Peter is saying, <clears throat> Gaining the knowledge of God, the first thing you need, diligence, you need to buy in, you need to, be, you need to buy into the process, you need to have some zeal for it. Yet you cannot know God if you're lukewarm about it. The Hebrew writer says that God will reward those who diligently seek Him, Hebrews 11:6. So after establishing the attitude, diligence, Peter lists seven pairs of virtues that when pursued, lead us to a fuller knowledge of God that in turn produces the joy and the peace, the increasing joy and peace in our hearts. So the first set, he says, faith and moral excellence. It begins with faith, believing in God and what God says, and this is naturally followed by doing what He says. A person's faith grows and is confirmed when he or she begins to live according to what they believe. So you start with faith and he says, add to your faith moral excellence. Well, living right, doing right. Well, what are some of the very first things that Christians do when they become Christians, right? They get rid of some of those surface bad habits, you know, you know, you know maybe stop cursing or you know, giving up the bottle or whatever. You know, we give up those surface vices. 
Well, that's moral excellence. And as you go in Christianity, you drill down deeper and deeper, you, know, you, start, you start working on hypocrisy, honesty, gener you, know, you start working on that stuff. Add to your faith moral excellence, he says. All right, now, second set. He borrows one, moral excellence, you got that going? Add to that knowledge. To a good and pure life, one is to add knowledge. This is not knowledge of God, interestingly enough, because that's, that's what you're pursuing, in the big picture, you're pursuing knowledge of God, but here, the knowledge that he talks about is a different word. The knowledge here is information, wisdom, the knowledge of oneself, the knowledge of one's word, the knowledge of God's word. Not only the ability to be a good person, but the ability to apply God's word to all situations in life, that requires knowledge and maturity and wisdom. So add to your good life wisdom, understanding that comes from your study of God's word and understanding of life and so on and so forth. Okay, next set. You see how he does it? He picks up knowledge. Okay, you got knowledge, add to that knowledge self-control. A wise person becomes a prudent person. A knowledgeable person begins to understand the nature of the enemy and the enemy's strength. A knowing person understands that controlling oneself, controlling one's tongue, controlling one's thoughts are the surest way to maintain faith and moral excellence. Right? You begin to think, you know what, this is my weak area. I, 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 need to, I need to be smart about my weak area and recognize that this is my weak area and I need not to play to my weak area, whatever that is. Okay. If your weak area is watching porn or whatever it is, you know, and, and, and the, 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 the cable company offers, got a special this, this month, they're offering ESPN and the Playboy Channel. <laughs> Maybe you ought to think twice about getting that extra free package because for some people that wouldn't make a difference. They, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't watch the Playboy channel if you paid them to watch it. But for other people, oh, that, that, would, that, would be, that would be difficult to do. So you, know, you add wisdom, know your, know your weakness. You can't have self-control if you don't know what it is you've got to control. Or if you deny you need control in that area. Another set to self-control, perseverance. So once the ABCs of the Christian walk are learned, you know, faith in God, holy living, knowledge, self-control, once you got that down, the key, he says, is to continue in these things regardless of what happens, stick with, stick with it. Many learn about the faith, they're happy to get rid of their sins that destroyed their lives in the first place, and they love to know more about God. But when adversity or persecution or pain or inconvenience comes, they give up, they fall away. Peter says that an indispensable link in the chain of uh, cultivating the ability to persevere in things already learned and habits already acquired, you've got to keep at it. You know, you made that good decision about the, the cable channels, you made that good decision, keep making those good decisions. Number five, to that perseverance, add godliness. Now this is a special one right here, this is key right here, this one. This is the point in the transformation that the new self becomes more evident. Up until now, it's been a ground game, you know what I'm saying? You're changing, you're developing, not too many people notice, you notice, not everybody else does, but when you get to number five, it starts to be evident that there's a change in you, and it's evident not just to yourself, but it starts to be evident to other people. I want to explain the idea of lift here. I'm not a pilot, I don't know about planes and that, but I do understand a little bit of the principle. You know, a plane is on the ground and it's, it's got to go a certain speed, right? It's on the ground, it's, it's, it's a ground mobile for a little while, right? Until it reaches a certain speed. And then when it reaches a certain speed, depending on the plane and so on and so forth, you get what's called liftoff, right? All of a sudden, whoops, 
the wind, the speed, the wind, everything, the flaps are down, and you, this thing that was rolling along the ground is now taken off, and now it's flying. It's got, it's got lift. Well, it's the same thing with Christianity. Up until number five, you're on the ground. You're speeding along. You're maybe going fast, but you're on the ground. But when you get to number five, when you start producing godliness in your life, you're starting to get spiritual liftoff. And the problem in Christianity with Christians is there's so many Christians that use their plane as cars. <laughs> Most of their Christian life, they're driving their plane around as a car. Does it get them from one place to another? Oh yeah, sure. But would you take a plane to go to 7-Eleven to you know, buy milk? Would it get you there? Well, sure it would get you there, but how ridiculous to drive your plane around as a car. And yet that's what most Christians do. <laughs> they drive their plane around as a car. So a lot of people for various reasons of training, idealism or self-will are wise and prudent and they're perseverant, yes, but only those who develop these qualities in a Christian context begin to evidence godliness. I'll give you another word for godliness begin to develop piety in their lives. And when that happens, spiritual liftoff takes place. Now godliness means that you are more like God than you are like man. You're more like God than you are like woman. To be more like Jesus than to be like yourself to belong more to the church than you belong to the world. See what I'm saying? That's liftoff, spiritual liftoff. So the regenerational process is definitely beginning to show outwardly at this point. Godliness, piety, Christ-likeness. More like Him than like you. Number six, to godliness, imagine you're thinking some other highfalutin word is going to come now, big theological deep idea, right? He says to godliness, what? Brotherly kindness. Jesus said that the unmistakable sign of discipleship was that you would know a lot of scripture by heart. Is that what he said? Or the unmistakable sign of discipleship would be that you would have regular church attendance. Is that what he said? No, he said the unmistakable sign of discipleship was that you would be loving your brother. That's the unmistakable sign of discipleship. I mean, if you're loving your brother, all those other things I mentioned are just included in the package. And we know that, John 13, 35. The one who knows God understands that God sent Jesus to die in order to do what? Establish the church. So God loves the church and those who know God, well they also love the church. For God, the church is the most important thing. So not to love the church, to disparage the church, to ignore, to minimize, to uh, minimize the importance of the church, to be unfaithful to the church is a sign that one does not really know God very well. You know, it's like, you can't be my friend and insult my wife. <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that. <laughs> you can't be my best buddy and talk badly about my sons or my daughters or my daughter-in-laws or my grandchildren. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. You, you can't do that. You can't pretend, you can't weasel your way into my affection by putting down the people that I, that I love. It's the same thing. You can't say, oh, I love you, God, but put his church down, because he loves the church. He sent his son to die for the church. The head of the church is God the Son, Jesus Christ. So to be godly is to be a lover of those who make up the church, warts and all, warts and all. Number seven, so to add to brotherly kindness, he says you add love. 
Loving those who love the Lord is a sign that you know the Lord. Loving those who hate the Lord and hate you and hate the church is not only a sign that you know the Lord, it's a sign that you love in the way that the Lord loves as well. See the difference? Our knowledge of God is only complete when we begin to love as He did and we are willing to lay down our lives for others, even others who hate us like they hated Him. So Christian love is the sure sign that as far as it is possible in this weak flesh, our knowledge of God is complete and we are enjoying the blessings of peace that God gives to all those who love as He loved. All right, so let's move to verse eight and nine. He says, for if these qualities, everything I've just talked about, for if these qualities are yours, and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. So Peter repeats his primary, you know, the primary idea at the very beginning. The way to know God and to enjoy the blessings of salvation is to continue growing and developing in these virtues because these virtues will bring you to a greater knowledge of God. Okay. To this idea he adds a second thought. That ignoring these things, that not concentrating on these things is foolish and it is a sign that a person is forgetting God's kindness in forgiving him in the first place. Yeah, do these things. But if you're not doing these things, you, you've forgotten what Christianity is all about. So he says in verse 10 and 11, Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about His calling and choosing of you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. So a final word of encouragement, I mean in this particular passage, okay. He repeats the original word, diligent. He started with, you know, be diligent. He finishes, you know, bookends, be diligent again. And he says, make an effort, pay attention, stay focused on these things and several things will be produced. So if you focus on these things, what's going to happen? Well, first of all, you're going to feel confident and secure about your salvation. There will be no guilt, no fear of death, no dread of judgment because you are certain that you will go to heaven because the knowledge of God brings security. The more I know God, the more secure I am in my salvation. Nobody can shake me. Number two, if you focus on these things, you will sin less. You won't be sinless. Everybody wants to be sinless. You know, I'm tired of making mistakes and putting my foot in my mouth and you know, getting angry for nothing and lying. You know, I'm, I'm tired of doing that. But you will sin much less if you focus on these things. Sin, you know, it causes trouble and sorrow and worry and pain. Those who are diligent in these kinds of things will sin less and not lose faith, which might cause one to fall away from Christ. And of course, when you fall away from Christ, you sin more. You know, if you find yourself sinning more and more, you're saying, what's my problem? Well, you're falling away from Jesus. That's, that's your problem. And then a third thing he says that'll happen, you will grow in knowledge. You will grow in your knowledge of God and His Son, Jesus. This idea now described as entering the kingdom. Remember I said the, the writers use different words to express the same ideas. So in one passage he talks about you know, uh, 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 salvation, uh, another passage he talks about knowing God, now he, he describes the same idea as entering into the kingdom. The change that we undergo is the process of being transported from earth to heaven. That's the, the, these seven things here, this is the process that transforms us from earthly being to heavenly beings, and the final break comes at our death. So Peter says 
that those who practice these virtues will experience an accelerated transfer from earthly to heavenly. In other words, they'll begin to experience heaven before they're actually transported to heaven. So if you begin to get a taste of heaven through the process of knowing God, that taste of heaven will give you that grace and peace, will give you that joy here, will give you that strength and security, that understanding to withstand any of the things that happen on this earth. And you know what's interesting about this? The, these virtues, it's not like you've got to memorize stuff, you've got to learn stuff, or there's like a secret that you've got to figure out. There's nothing like that. It's very you know, plain as to what you need to be actually doing. Of course, Peter was not just philosophizing here. This is not just theological speculation. He was talking to real people about their spiritual progress and how to move it along. The practical application for our lives is to determine where are we at in this process. If there's any takeaway from this class this morning, if you've got the notes, or one, you, know, you need to ask yourself at some point, where am I in this thing here? Are we at the beginning, you know, dealing with the preliminary issues of faith and morals? Is that where we're at? Perhaps being baptized, we haven't done that yet, or, or giving up our bad habits, or getting to church on a regular basis. Is that where we're adding? Adding to our basic faith you know, some moral virtue? Is that where we're at? It's OK. You know, as, as long as we understand, oh, that's where I'm at in the, on the continuum. Or are we further along the line, you know, persevering in leadership or struggling to maintain a godly image in a perverse world? You know? So whether you're at, wherever you're at rather, this lesson is a reminder that you need to be diligent in your efforts to grow spiritually. It's not easy, but it, it needs to be done because if you don't grow, you are going to die spiritually. Secondly, there is a pattern to the growth and Peter describes it here. You can know where you're at and you can know which way to go to increase. You know, it's not a guessing game in Christianity. What's the direction? What do I need to do? It's, it's laid out here. This is what you need to do. And thirdly, the ultimate goal, of course, is to love as Jesus loved. You know, those bracelets, you know, what would Jesus do? Good idea. I mean, I've done that myself. I've asked myself, what would the Lord do in a situation like this? You know, you help. Uh, help, you know, but uh, there should be another bracelet. And it should say, thank you. And it should say, how would Jesus love? How would Jesus love? How would He love? How would He express His love in this particular situation? And that's what this passage eventually leads you to in the end. Okay, that's our class for this morning. We'll continue on, Second Peter, on our, in our next session. Thank you for your, thank you for your attention.